ವಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಡೋರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕಿ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಫೋರ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ವಿ ಡಿಡ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪ್ಯಾರಡಾಕ್ಸಿಕಲ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ವರ್ ವೆರಿ ಕ್ರೂಷಲ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ದ ವರ್ಸ್ ವಾಸ್ ದಿ ಏಯ್ಟೀನ್ತ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಫೋರ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಯುಲ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಕರ್ಮಣ್ಯ ಅಕರ್ಮಯ ಪಶ್ಯೇತ್ ಅಕರ್ಮಣಿ ಚ ಕರ್ಮಯ ಸ ಬುದ್ಧಿಮಾನ್ ಮನುಷ್ಯೇಶು ಸ ಯುಕ್ತ ಸ ಕೃತ್ನ ಕರ್ಮ ಕೃತ್ ವಟ್ ಡಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಮೀನ್ ದ ವನ್ ಹೂ ಸೀಸ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಇನ್ ಇನ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಮಿಡ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ವೇರ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಪರೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ನೋ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಸಚ್ ಅ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇಸ್ ವೈಸ್ ಅಮಂಗ್ ಹ್ಯೂಮನ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಸಚ್ ಅ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಟ್ರೂ ಯೋಗಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸಚ್ ಅ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಡೂಅರ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಪ್ಯಾರಡಾಕ್ಸಿಕಲ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿ ಇಂಡಿಕೇಟಿಂಗ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಶೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಇಸ್ ದಟ್ ದಿ ಎನ್ಲೈಟನ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಹೂ ರಿಯಲೈಸಸ್ ದಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪ್ಯೂರ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಬ್ಲಿಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟೀಸ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ಲೆವೆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಬಾಡಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ಲೆವೆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ವಿಟ್ನೆಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ದ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಲ್ಯೂಮಿನ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟೀಸ್ ದೆರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಚೇಂಜ್ ದೇರ್ ದೆರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟಿ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಫರ್ ಎವರ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ಸೊ ಐ ಆಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಿಟ್ನೆಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಐ ಡು ನಾಟ್ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಈವನ್ ವೆನ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವರ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಥ್ರೂ ದಿ ಬಾಡಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಈವನ್ ವೆನ್ ಐ ಮೇ ಬಿ ಥಿಂಕಿಂಗ್ ಐಮ್ ಟಾಕಿಂಗ್ ವಾಕಿಂಗ್ ಈಟಿಂಗ್ ಇಂಟರ್ಯಾಕ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಐ ಡು ನಾಟ್ ಡೂ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ಎನ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟನ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಆನೆಸ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಸೇ ಮೇ ಬಿ ದೇ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಸೇ ಇಟ್ ಬಟ್ ದೇ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಆನೆಸ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಸೇ ಟು ದೆಮ್ಸೆಲ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಟು ದೆಮ್ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟನ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಈವನ್ ವೆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟನ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಹಿ ಸೇ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ವರ್ಕ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟಿ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಐಮ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇನ್ವಾಲ್ವ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ದೋ ಅಪರೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅವರ್ ಪರ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟಿವ್ ಫುಲ್ಲಿ ಇನ್ವಾಲ್ವ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಮೋರ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿವ್ ದೆನ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ but krishna is saying here from my perspective if you ask me honestly if you ask are you not driving the chariot are you not uh, um, you know doing all this action help talking about the geeta giving the geeta advice to to arjuna he will say yes truly are you doing that no actually not because from the point of view of it's like the 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 screen on which the movie is playing um, is there a lot of activity going on lot of action uh, going on there comedy tragedy yes truly so no truly it's just uh, a screen and light and sound so the enlightened person sees there is no action in the midst of intense action swami vivekananda said that from that perspective there is eternal calm in the midst of intense activity and um, where there is absolute quietness outside you don't fall asleep one can be internally we're also very, very active but from the perspective of the atman from the perspective of reality you are beyond activity beyond beyond karma beyond cause and effect that's what it means and uh, the wise person also sees the enlightened person also sees in the so called apparent inactivity of the unwise the person who thinks i will not get involved in samsara i'm going to run away and sit uh, in a mountain cave and meditate and there i will get peace in that also the enlightened person sees there is activity there that's uh, there is agentship a person is deciding to do not this but that and you still caught this is most important you are still caught in the cycle of karma you still caught in the cycle of karma uh, there, there is no escape for such a person that is not the way out swami vivekananda said you cannot run away from the machine you have to learn how to work the machine machine means samsara maya you have to learn how to work the machine and the machine will set you free right so um this is what the enlightened person sees and this is why it's called sabuddhiman such a person is enlightened remember it, it's a strange thing normally what would you say if you see a thing as it is uh, if you see the thing as it is you are you are wise if you see something as it is not how can you be wise so if you see action as action and inaction as inaction involvement
he is not speaking from the perspective of a person he is speaking from the perspective of reality as being as awareness um sabuddhiman so this is real wisdom so yukta such a person is truly centered in the atman truly centered in the truth established in the truth so yukta means a true yogi and, and kritsna karma krit a very interesting phrase the doer of all actions why do people do actions people do actions for fulfillment people are involved in the world you study and you work out and you get married and children have a job pursue a career um, try to get people to you know get the praise of people um, achieve things in life all of it a great deal of activity for what for fulfillment now the tragedy is that activity cannot lead to fulfillment it has its place fulfillment comes from god realization fulfillment comes from enlightenment from knowing the infinitude of the self this person has realized that having realized that one can say then this person the enlightened one has truly accomplished the purpose of all actions purpose of all actions fulfillment this person fulfilled not by actions by enlightenment so you can say what all people in the world what they are trying to get by all these activities this person has got it hence this person is the doer of all actions in the sense of having got the the ultimate goal or purpose of all action so that is the background now what krishna is going to do is from the 19th verse up to the 24th this section itself it shows um advaita in uh, in action <laughs> the manifestation of advaitic knowledge once you become enlightened how do you live life in second chapter he introduced us to advaitic knowledge the realization uh, chidananda roopa shivoham my my divine nature how do you realize that you are the atman that was introduced in the second chapter third chapter he talked about uh, karma yoga but karma yoga as a method to purify and get ready for enlightenment but now he is bringing all of that together how after enlightenment one can live one's life one can act in the world that that's very important so these are the two important questions in our life what spirituality promises god realization enlightenment how do i do that how do i get it that's one second how do i um, live my life i still have my life to lead um, the world is there my body is there i'm i'm living so what what guidance do i have for living my life both of these are combined in this section verse 18 onwards and it will come to a grand climax in verse 24 now going ahead verse number 19 all of these are very beautiful verses and full of um, spiritual insight the way we can live our lives we also we, can, we don't have to wait for enlightenment what the the insights which are given here we can put it to use in our our life to the extent that we can ये सरंभा काम सकलवर्जिता ज्ञानाग्निदग्धकर्माण तमाहो पंडित बुधा हि हूज एक्शन आर ऑल फ्री फ्रॉम हैंकरिंग फॉर डिजायर्स हूज एक्शन हैव बीन बर्न बाय द फायर ऑफ नॉलेज हिम द वाइज कॉल अ सेज नाइंटींथ वर्स सो वॉट डज दिस मीन here the question is will the enlightened after enlightenment once you have this realization will you at all uh, interact with the world will you at or will you sit on top of a mountain or in an ashram will you at all do anything in this world uh, one second or not and the answer in no uncertain terms is given in this verse yes you will active samarambha activity life can be full of activities for the enlightened person but where is the difference and why the question is why would an enlightened person act how would he act which is different from all other activity of everybody else and why at all what's the motivation for an enlightened person to act and where does this motivation come from how is this motivation different from the motivation of the rest of us who act for other purposes so for that we have to see this term is there kama sankalpa varjita devoid of hankering beyond the hankering for fulfillment of desires see 
why do most people act from a vedantic perspective action is where does this come from by action i mean everything that we do in life consciously deliberately whatever we do in life vedanta says it all comes from desire kama kama means desire desire for fulfillment i am unfulfilled and i want want fulfillment and therefore whatever i think will fulfill me uh, beyond even the, the biological needs and i need food and shelter fine but beyond that i need company i need uh, uh, education and i need money i need everything else that society tells me you know the society uh, is con- constantly bombarding us with things you need this to get a smiley face right so um kama comes uh, because i feel i need fulfillment but why do i feel that i need fulfillment somewhere there's a deep feeling that i am unfulfilled i am limited and this comes from avidya ignorance agyana or avidya ignorance of my ever fulfilled nature i do not know that i am the atman i do not know my uh, inner spiritual nature and therefore not knowing it not knowing that i'm sachidananda the infinite unlimited existence consciousness i that is hidden from me and then i become identified with a mind and a body the moment i am identified with the mind and the body i'm stuck i'm trapped in samsara because the mind and body by themselves are limited there's no doubt this body uh, it's too so dependent on uh, food on on i mean a little bit of bad health in this body little bit of pain it immediately affects the mind the mind itself so dependent on the praise of others on the good behavior of others on the fulfillment of so many desires so moment i am identified with body and mind i will become limited and i will be open to feel, feelings of being not fulfilled not satisfied and therefore desire will come karma and then i will work to fulfill those desires working to fulfill desires karma coming from desires karma coming from avidya remember this phrase shankaracharya is fond of it avidya kama karma ignorance desire action ignorance desire action so avidya kama karma you will say what's wrong with it so if you are if you are in action in activity what's wrong then you are trapped in the cycle of samsara action will lead to consequence kama karma will lead to karma phala results of karma and then that cycle goes on repeating itself and then beyond this lifetime also it will push us into other lives other bodies other experiences so on so to come out of this cycle you need enlightenment but the question is after enlightenment will this person act will this person be engaged um, the answer given in no uncertain terms by krishna is certainly certainly samarambha activity can go on the enlightened person's life apparently can be full full of activity of course we remember that the enlightened person will say i don't i do nothing in the midst of all activities he will say i see no activity at all no karma i am not trapped in karma i am the reality i am the movie screen so what comedy or what tragedy i am beyond all of it and yet all of it can go on how will it be different the difference will be this the enlightened person not having ignorance will not have sense of lack of fulfillment and will not have desires coming from lack of fulfillment and will not act out of for, for to fulfill those desires so the enlightened person acts from contentment we act from discontent the enlightened person acts from peace an unshakable peace we act from out of disturbance because we don't have peace that's why we are acting trying to regain the lost equilibrium the enlightened person is ever in equilibrium the enlightened person acts out of satisfaction we act out of dissatisfaction we we are in karma we are trying to fulfill desires enlightened person is has no desires to fulfill so this is the difference then you will say still the question remains what is the motivation then why what motivation remains for an enlightened person we i understand my motivation there are certain things i want in to do list yeah, to do list so people get white board 1 2 3 4 you'll write down and then to write things in the white do board also becomes one more thing to do so in the to do list <laughs> what to do uh, and then uh, i am acting out of that the enlightened person does not have that then why should the enlightened person act at all and the answer is the enlightened person acts 
out of uh, what is called loka sangraha desire for the welfare of the world uh, sri krishna has said that acts out of um, compassion acts out of love acts out of concern for others acts out of a sense of giving not for getting something from others so to give not not for getting not for trying to get fulfillment already fulfilled tries to fulfill others so this is the re- reason the enlightened person acts but then where does this motivation come from where does this love come from where does this desire to help others where does this come or isn't it another desire no the source is then the enlightenment itself this enlightened being now knows that he or she is one with everybody there is one consciousness and i am that in all those bodies i am the one as i feel hungry and try try to feed this body so also i should try to satisfy the hunger of others as i am hurt and i need uh, relief from pain in this body so also i try to help and take care of others i know it is me i shine forth in all of those beings it is the same divinity they know it not and the enlightened being knows it that's the only difference and knowing it from that comes compassion it can come um, if you are devotional then it will not be compassion it will be devotion sri ramakrishna said who are you to show compassion it is shiva gyan jeeva seva knowing the divinity is present in all these beings no matter what mask they are putting on friend enemy indifferent to me good or bad whatever it is the di- same divinity is behind everybody and then will you show compassion to god no it will be worship of god so you worship the god in the temple with flowers and incense and chanting you worship the god in the classroom through chalk and talk and blackboard and lectures you worship the god in the hospital uh, through medicine and uh, nursing and so on so it comes out of that feeling of oneness with everybody in fact all ethics it's a big topic all ethics comes from that why should i do good to others as swami vivekananda says why should i not cut the throat of my neighbor if it is to my advantage why should i love my neighbor where is the justification for that the justification is in this advaitic realization so therefore this enlightened person acts how is the motivation different from us you see this is what swami vivekananda called the manifestation of the divinity within after having realized the divinity within i am brahman then it is to be manifested in my thinking in my words and mostly in my activity so my activity will now become seva or service um three points here i mean three kinds of manifestation of this the enlightened person can act and that action can be of two kinds the action is so the first option is the enlightened person after enlightenment keeps on doing what he or she has been doing earlier just the role in your society you are a husband or a wife or a mother or father you have you are a corporate executive or like arjuna a warrior in the battlefield you go on doing your duty as an enlightened person duty in the sense that this is the natural place of this body mind i am not this body mind what does this body mind have to do you do the once you, the, you know that you are the actor in a play knowing that you are an actor in the play what will you do will you start now you, you realize i am not the um you know i'm not a beggar uh, i'd rather be the emperor so will the actor immediately change the script and try to start pretending as the emperor it'll ruin the play if you if you say i am an actor i am not bound by the limitation of the role you have given me if you tell the director i will give whatever dialogue i like i'll play what i will act the way i like i free because it's not real for me then you will simply ruin the play so the enlightened being plays the part which you are you know the enlightened person has been set into continues to play that sri ramakrishna gave a uh, cute example he said uh, a clerk had been put in jail for some reason now he's set free and then he says will he dance around like a madman after being set free from jail no he'll, no he'll go back to being a clerk he'll he'll keep on doing in bengali it makes a little it has more punch kerani ki jail khana theke rehai pe dhai dhai kore nachbe naki she kerani giri korbe abar so that's the yeah, bengali the enlightened being will go back to do to do what he he or she was doing so in our 
scriptures in the texts ancient texts you have um you have uh, descriptions of housewives who were enlightened after being enlightened will does the person say okay i'm not going to cook anymore i'm 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 enlightened now i'm going to go around giving uh, vedanta talks no they they were happy enough to do exactly what they were doing earlier and yet it it's nothing to them there are kings uh, emperors who became enlightened uh, janaka for example and others also so did they say that i am enlightened now this is not for me i'm going to go to an ashram no i like that story about nisarga datta maharaj a modern enlightened person in mumbai who lived in a slum after his enlightenment experience he set out for the himalayas apparently i was reading that and then he felt what am i doing so what is it exactly that i'm sits, uh, searching on the mountain top which is not in that terrible slum in mumbai it's the same brahman everywhere the difference is only name and form why am i seeking peace in the mountains i should be able to find it right here and so he went came back to that slum and yes he sold beads you know those so uh, uh, like cigarettes and, but much worse than cigarettes so uh, and he kept on doing that till the very end of his life and all people who went to him for enlightenment they had to go to that slum and see search him out and sit in that place for to uh, anyway so the question is so the point is the person make one option is continue to do what they were doing or the second option may actually do something different so when swami vivekananda talks about uh, karma yoga uh, for you know massive action for the upliftment of the poor for serving the sick you know uh, action social action you can do a lot of good to the world and often enlightened person or they might go out and teach that's another thing that um, enlightened people share they want people to have the same and realization that's a big motivation so they do that um so notice karma yoga sri krishna in the bhagavad gita and uh, swami vivekananda same karma yoga but there's a different flavor to it sri krishna says to arjuna what you were going to do fight this war do the same thing but now as karma yoga swami vivekananda says that you are monks or uh, lay people but now engage in activity for the welfare of the world so he's not saying that your own existing duty new thing he's saying take it up this new great field of action for the welfare of humanity engage yourself spend this life in in uh, and as a sacrifice to the welfare of the virat of this uh, divinity all around you you see the slight difference in the two kinds of karma yoga both are perfectly all right so these are the two options there's a third option the enlightened person can actually withdraw from karma also can become one of those traditional wandering monks don't think that if they do not do any karma they are not enlightened certainly they can be fully enlightened you can sit like ramana maharshi completely absorbed in the, in the, in brahman you can wander around like tota puri sri ramakrishna's guru are they not enlightened of course they are so all three are possible do they act yes and two kinds of action um, just doing what they were doing earlier maybe you will not even recognize them um or doing some extraordinary action teaching social action uplift of people and so on big thing you will recognize them as very magnificent people indeed or third they will know they will not act they will act means they will not be engaged in um, the usual activity whereas the ordinary motives for action are one people act for worldly fulfilling worldly desires two they act for fulfilling other worldly desires so what are other worldly desires we don't generally don't have them now because as one senior monk told us uh, because <laughs> the modern people don't believe in other worlds don't believe in heaven or anything like that but the heaven was a thing that the ancient vedic people not only really vedic buddhist jains so they believed in multiple heavens a much better place than this and if you are a good person and you get a lot of what is called punya merit do meritorious action um, the religious rituals like the vedic sacrifices you get to go to one of these higher heavens after that again temporary and when the results of action run out you come back again to this world so that's an other worldly desire it's still worldly you see the worldly world is there it's still worldly so people act for that or if they are spiritual like all the people here 
we say we don't want to satisfy we don't we are not interested in worldly desires not even other worldly desires to for vedanta you must have this is called vairagya then why do you act why do you come to class why do you read books why do you meditate why do you do japa why do you serve people why do you try to change yourself be a better person a lot of practices going on here why so this is for moksha for enlightenment for god realization for liberation that's what we are all trying to do enlightened persons actions for none of this they are a different class altogether they are not doing it for for the satisfaction of worldly desires they have none they are not doing it for satisfaction of other worldly desires they are not interested in going to heaven they are not even doing it for moksha because they already have it shankaracharya sings na dharma na chartho na kamo na moksha i am not doing it for satisfaction of you know for getting pleasure i am not doing i am not i do not want um wealth artha i do not even want um, you know to do good actions to get merits so that i can go to heaven after death no i do not even mar- want um, uh, enlightenment and liberation no moksha why because you already already liberated and then what are you chidananda roopa shivoham shivoham i am of the nature of consciousness bliss i am shiva i am shiva so this is the difference between the activity or non activity of the enlightened person compared to the rest of us the rest of us includes people who have worldly goals people who have other worldly goals and people who have spiritual goals a sadhaka spiritual seeker still is a person who has a goal remember we all have a we, we have to be very careful about it we may not have when we say we do karma yoga unselfish action unselfish in the sense that we do not have selfish worldly goals or other worldly goals but we have the goal of enlightenment which is a wonderful thing but we have it until one is enlightened one should not say that i have nothing to do in this world we have okay now let us look at the words quickly so who all of whose activities which means sarve samarambha there so there is a plenty of activity going on there so the enlightened person is acting kama sankalpa varjita is devoid of desire and the sankalpa the determination the cognitions behind desire so what are these sankalpa means samyak buddhi samyakto buddhi that means the idea this is good this is nice i could use some of that i could use some more money i could use some of these gadgets i could use a new car uh, i could i could use a covid vaccine you know and so this stuff like that and so that is the thing that this is good i need it the moment we have that is called sankalpa what happens it gives rise it sprouts as desire i want and then i go out and get it you can't stop it after that it will come in thought and speech and activity kama sankalpa varjita the enlightened person is devoid of all of these but remember not devoid of all motivation there is the motivation of doing good to world to the world which we just described uh, we talked about which is an expression of the realization itself manifestation of the divinity itself that's that's their motivation not like this gyanagni dagdha karmanam all the actions of the enlightened person so if they're doing actions won't be generate results so won't there'll be new uh, actions and so won't it continue for them no it won't first of all the enlightenment brahma gyana it is supposed to destroy all accumulated karma sri ramakrishna put it this way he says suppose there's a mountain of cotton and you take someone takes a matchstick and throws it lights it and throws it into this mountain of cotton what will happen Even, no matter how huge is this mountain of cotton it's going to burn up in a trice it just go it will just go up in a blaze immediately knowledge is like that no matter all our good and bad karma stored up in past lives we have no idea of it but once you realize you are not the body and mind you are brahman all that is destroyed it's gone it will not give rise results later on what about activities now right now you are saying that the enlightened person engages in lots of activities won't that generate new karma maybe good karma but still new karma no because the enlightened person has no sense of agency the i is still there but the enlightened person knows i am not the i what kind of crazy talk is that not me i am quoting shankaracharya mano buddhya ahankara chittani na aham ahankara na aham what is the meaning of that 
I am not the mind, I am not the memory, I am not the intellect, I am not the ego. N notice, I am not the ego. What does that mean? I am not I. I means the ego. Without that ego prompted action, there is nowhere that, you know, Maya can peg, tag you with the karma. Karma is generated. To whom will Maya attach? To, to, to what account will Maya put that karma? There's no account. All accounts closed. <laughs> Swami Bhuteshanji put this so beautifully. One day we were asking, I, I, I was there, but a senior monk was asking. I was just a novice. So Bhuteshanji was the 12th president of our order. And I believe at least, most of us believe that he was an enlightened being, a Jeevan Mukta. So somebody was trying to get an idea of what it is like from his perspective. So uh, the monk was asking, but we see an enlightened person walks and talks and, um, you know, just like the rest of us. He eats and recognizes people and all of that, all activities go on. He said, and he would speak with this slow drawl, he said, that's what you see. And then this uh, monk asked, exactly, that's what we want to know, Swami. What does the enlightened one see? What does it feel like from the inside? What does the enlightened one see? And his answer was, who sees? Who sees? I'm not going to explain that. You can understand. It's not like there's another person in there, like a limited person like us. So who sees? In Bengali, he said, Ke dake. So, it is like the seeds being roasted in fire. So after roasting seeds in fire, they will still look like the same seeds, but they will not sprout. If you plant them, they will not sprout. Similarly, it looks like karma. And looks like all the results of karma are there, but they will not sprout into new lives, new bodies, and uh, you know, continuation of the cycle of birth and death. It will not give rise to that. Of course, I have read other accounts, other theories. One theory, interesting theory is, no, karma always has to give results. You can't say that it will not give results. So it will not give results to that person maybe, but the, once the work has been done, it will set in motion karma. The wheel of karma will still rotate. Now those results have to be given to somebody. And so there's a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, like a uh, implication of the, this karma theory. If there's an enlightened person, all the activities of the enlightened person, all the good activities, which are mostly good activities, of course, all the punya, the merit, will go to the, those who honor this enlightened person, those who serve this enlightened person, the disciples whom he blesses. Um, so it, is, it, go, it goes all the way back to the Upanishads. Atmagyam hi achayet bhuti kamaha. Mundakopanishad. Those who want prosperity in this world, those who want things in this world, worldly desires, you know what's the quickest way to get them? Go and serve an enlightened being. Of course, you have to get hold of an enlightened being first. Do something, something for an enlightened being. Your desires will be fulfilled. It's, it's uh, uh, guaranteed. Worldly desires. Why? Well, how does that happen? Is that the enlightened being going and fulfilling your desires? Not at all. He probably would not want your desires, those worldly desires to be fulfilled. But it will still be fulfilled because of all the enormous merit generated by this enlightened being which will give rise to the fulfillment of desires for those who um, serve or you know honor this person. Um, so this is a common idea in India. In the villages, even till today, so they don't know who's enlightened. So if a monk comes along, they're very eager to serve, but there's a hidden motive there that our desires will be fulfilled. <laughs> so there's a, um, this story in Uttarakhand, in the Himalayas. So a monk comes along and begs, uh, and uh, this lady of the house is giving food to that monk. And the man of the house is not happy with this. Is, why are you, why do you give food to these, uh, you know, these useless uh, wandering beggars? And he says, see, by the grace of the enlightened one, uh, uh, our desires, uh, we will have a happy life. So then this the husband says, how do you know this guy is enlightened? It just looks like a, you know, like, how do you know any one of them is enlightened? They could just be wandering beggars. And unfazed, the lady says, in that case, Next life, this person will come back and work as our bullock in our fields. <laughs> if he's not enlightened and still he's eating, there's no free lunch. There's no free lunches. So, 
So she is perfectly all right. She's going to say, I've, I've got the better end of the bargain. Either we are going to get good karma of the enlightened being the, the blessings of this enlightened one, or if he's a useless guy, then he's going to come back in the next life and we'll put him to work in our fields as a bullock. Mm. Yeah, so there are many such stories. I remember once I was going in a train uh, with in India with another monk. I was a novice in a white dress, but the monk was of course in an orange dress. And there was a gentleman who was from a village, like a rustic kind of gentleman, who was sitting in the seat in front of us. So he started a tirade against monks while seeing that monk. He kept on grumbling and criticizing and so the Swami kept quiet. I was getting very annoyed, but the Swami kept quiet. After some time, when it came time for that gentleman to get down, he was a traditional gentleman with a dhoti and a kutta and all, suddenly he was overcome with remorse. He got up suddenly and he folded his hands and he went to the Swami and he said, please forgive me for saying all those things. Why? There's fear. There's that fear. Because the downside of this theory that the enlightened one wants good karma uh, will help the one who serves, those who dishonor, or disobey or you know like harm the enlightened one in any way or try to harm uh, all the bad karma whatever is there will will <laughs> come upon this person so you have to be careful mm. yeah. though it's not related I'm reminded of the story of Sri Ramakrishna and the Holy Mother I think he told Hridaya Ram probably who uh, uh, who was misbehaving with him and he told him that, do whatever you will to this one, to himself. I don't mind. But be careful of the one who lives in the Nahabad. The, that means the Holy Mother, who is the most timid and shy woman. And he said, be careful of that one. If that one, the one who is within her, if that one hisses, Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara will, won't be able to help you. The gods of the universe also cannot help you. If that one, even in the slightest bit, in the slightest, this, uh, uh, you know, um, unhappiness you cause to that one. So that is Shakti. And that, so there you have to be very careful. Of course that's not related to what we are talking about. So it's like a burnt um, seed. Sri so Ramakrishna gave another example of a burnt rope. So a rope which is burnt, it has the outline of a rope. It looks like a rope, maybe a little blacker than usual. But it can't tie anybody. If you blow upon it, it will fly away into ashes. So Similarly, karma, which is seen as a rope to bind people, bind means to cause an effect, causality. You can't escape. Swami Vivekananda said, good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. So you cannot escape. But if that law, that rope is a burnt rope, rope burned by the fire of knowledge, it can't bind you. It can't bind the enlightened person. Tamahu panditam buddha. Buddha means shastra gyaha. Uh, those who know, understand the purport of the, of the texts, of the scriptures, they call such a one. Who is this one? Jivan Mukta Mahapurusha, the enlightened, living, while, while free while living. Such a person is called Pandit. It's very interesting. The word Pandit, of course, has come into English now. Now there are Wall Street Pandits and political Pandits. Generally, are always wrong in predicting either the Wall Street or these days elections and results also. So, but Pandit, generally, it has come from a Sanskrit word. It means, uh, traditionally it means a scholar. Uh, Pandit is a, is a scholar. Often referred to, uh, often Brahmin uh, scholars are called Pandits. Um, in spirituality, in Vedanta, it has a deeper meaning. Panda means, you know, even the word Panda, those who are from India, you know, it, it refers to a temple priest. So, in Orissa, in the Lingaraj temple or the temple of Jagannath, the Pandas are that. They generally have a bad reputation. They have a reputation of being money grubbing. They are always out for a handout. Uh, they will try to get uh, money from you for doing this puja or that worship or something. But that's not the original meaning of Panda. Panda means Atma Vishaya Pragya. There's a very beautiful definition of what a Pandit really is. A very Vedantic definition. So this is a rare commentary on the Bhagavad Gita by a Swami called Shankaranandaji. So it's a very... Um, it's about four, five hundred years old. Uh, it's a very non-dualistic commentary. Uh, it was written, you can easily see it was written just for monks. 
ஹிந்தி ட்ரான்ஸ்லேஷன் எக்ஸிஸ்ட் பட் இங்கிலீஷ் ட்ரான்ஸ்லேஷன் இஸ் நாட் தேர் எட் ஸோ ஹியர் ஹி கிவ்ஸ் அ வெரி பியூட்டிஃபுல் டெஃபினேஷன் ஆஃப் பண்டித் ஹி சேஸ் பண்டா கல்யாணி சர்வத்ர பிரம்ம மாத்திர அவகாஹினா அவகாஹினி அகண்டாத்மா ஆத்மிகா விற்பி ரசிய சஞ்சாத இது பண்டிதா ஸோ த ஒன் who has that flash of enlightenment what flash of enli- enlightenment uh, akhandat akhandatmika vritti or akhandakara vritti that vritti means the the that breakthrough aham brahmasmi i am brahman that has arisen in this person sarvatra brahma matra vagahini not only i am brahman in every experience that person sees brahman and brahman only this enlightenment this final ultimate realization is called panda the one who has it is a pandit so that's a far cry from our modern pandits a pandit is an enlightened person a fully enlightened person such a person you know all of whose actions arise without any promptings of desire the results of all of those actions are burnt by the fires of knowledge such a person the wise not the rest we the ordinary people won't recognize such a person but the wise they recognize and they call this person a pandit this has also uh, a reference to sri krishna's uh, you know when he starts teaching the gita to to arjuna second chapter 11th verse in the second chapter 11th verse krishna says that anvasho ashotyan anvashochastvam pragyavadanscha bhashase gatasu na gatasu anscha nanu shochanti panditah he says o arjuna you are speaking like a pandit but you you speak wise words but a true pandit will not speak the way you are speaking that's that's how the bhagavad gita starts now he shows what a true pandit is so that was in the second chapter the beginning of second chapter 11th verse the first words that krishna uttered uh, you know so now he says what is a true pandit an enlightened person enlightened being okay before i go on to the next verse i just quickly see what's going on in the chat so bill is asking um is the a in ananda a negation like the a in ahimsa no 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 ananda this is a means a samanta complete joy this is not a negation of joy ahimsa is as a short a a himsa and Uh, in ananda it is ananda that means um, a complete joy it's not a negation when one realizes one self as the witness consciousness does one at that point experience cosmic consciousness um experience cos- cosmic consciousness that one has to be careful about dealing with that phrase one does realize the final realization would be i am that there is that one consciousness in all beings and i am that and that's the realization aham brahmasmi if you want to call that cosmic consciousness yes it is true but what i guess what you mean is does that person feel experience through everybody's eyes experience through you know like sees through everybody's eyes hears through everybody sees what's in the minds of everybody does that happen no 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 that experience is left only to god god alone that is called omniscience and god alone is omniscient so how is that different from an ordinary enlightened being an ordinary ordinary within quotes and no enlightened being is ordinary uh, it knows that he or she is the absolute reality beyond god individual and the cosmos so i am the absolute that is the realization of an enlightened being not i am god uh, girish is asking can an enlightened person direct the waking dream no Does it affect the natural course of the empirical world? No, not as a matter of uh, course. But um, 
some can this is why it cre creates confusion um, so many of the enlightened persons are blessed with extraordinary powers so what, what you might call them supernatural powers but they're nothing supernatural they're just natural powers which we don't know them that they do exist so some of them have it to an extraordinary degree sometimes they have attained enlightenment through the practice of either yoga or tantra in both ways one gets these powers um, that way if you're looking for powers advaita vedanta is uh, a sort of you know <laughs> is a kind of powerless uh, dull way of becoming enlightened it's it's like somebody compared it to a rocket it takes you straight to the goal and deposits you there but then you miss the, miss the scenic route so the scenic route is the path of uh, um, yoga or uh, tantra for example and they do develop uh, several extraordinary powers again every spiritual master warns you against these powers so some of them may have the power of changing certain things in their proximity uh, they sort of sort of directing the course of events in the waking state so that is to be um, should not confuse that with enlightenment uh, enlightened person just knows the waking dreaming and deep sleep are appearances in the one consciousness which i am all right happy diwali to everybody and then what else is there does karma yoga also mean saying yes to every everything asked for why uh, karma yoga means that you do not ask for everything you do not ask for anything at all so yeah. I yeah. can add I can add some context to that question. Yes. So basically, karma yoga, you know, you are I've been explaining in your talks that you know we have to be unselfish. Yes. So I just wanted to know that where do you draw a line or a boundary of being unselfish? Because the moment you go on a journey to become unselfish. Yes. The first thing is that you are asked to do many things, and everything you want to do, uh, uh, what do you say? You can samarpaya me to God. Right? Yes. everything you want to do for god yes so when unselfishness comes there you might be asked to do many many things like many many people let's say for example i'm going on the road no 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 uh, unselfishness does not mean uh, becoming totally aimless and at the mercy of anybody oh, here comes an unselfish karma yogi let me put him to work no uh, <laughs> common sense is always there yes. uh, so you would that's why i said there are two kinds of uh, activities one might be you just go on doing what you are doing you are a student you are you are a householder you are a monk whatever is there in your situation in life you go on doing that nothing more nothing less or you might em embark on some new project out of you know which comes naturally to you uh, in every case it is um, always there's this common sense i mean it's good thing always to look at people you would consider to be enlightened or great karma yogis watch their lives there's nothing crazy there they're actually much more sane than most of us then abhijit is asking sadhan chatushtaya does vairagya mean no desire or no sankalpa and does uparati mean no desire or no no sankalpa because if, if, if you cannot remove desire without sankalpa so one tries to overcome sankalpas uh, sankalpa means thinking that these things will fulfill me realize that nothing in the world will fulfill me and my whole time and energy is now dedicated to god realization and also whatever action that has to that comes my way if you have a, a household to take care of you do that that also is converted into spiritual practice so it becomes focused that way um, no other sankalpa arises or even if it arises that's that's part of the spiritual practice why would a sankalpa arise at all it comes from my past conditioning there are desires in the mind we are not become enlightened yet we are not perfect so desires will keep arising and the time the whole effort is to overcome them to go beyond that to convince oneself that they have not provided deep satisfaction to me so many years not to anybody else so hence yeah uh, then is there somebody asking a question all right um jayant uh, dimitri you can ask yeah uh dimitri samaji <coughs> yes uh, could you tell me if my kind of if i understanding it in the right way so uh at the end of it is actually the true self like the the brahman that grants the enlightenment like it's no matter of my uh jiva and uh, my uh ego trying to make efforts it's it's all good but at the end it's kind of the brahman who grants uh the enlightenment 
would it be correct to think that kind of my desires for God, my desires for Vedanta, for you know, self-improvement, uh, for doing good to the, to the world, is essentially driven by the plan of the Brahman to realize uh, itself in this world. And therefore, like, my ego really doesn't control anything. Like, I am observing the game uh, that is played by the Brahman through my jiva, and when enlightenment will be happening, it will happen. And all I am left to do is actually sort of watch, nothing else. All right. Now, let me ask you this question. Did you notice what you just said? Brahman, my ego, and I. Three things you yes. mentioned. Yes. What are you? The one that looks. The witness. If you are the witness of the I, the ego, then you are not the ego. Yes. No. You are not the ego. Now what Vedanta says is, very good. Explore the nature of this witness. Forget Brahman for a while. Explore the nature of this witness. What is this witness? So if you are not the I, the I is appearing to you, I means the ego, and so is the mind, thoughts and feelings and emotions, all of them appear to you, body appears to you, yeah. you experience it. Yeah. Notice that um, you are common to all the thoughts and stages of the body-mind, you know, they come and go in your light, you do not come and go um, with them. So you, the light which observes all of this, it has to be a kind of light. Light, I don't mean a physical light. It has to be kind of awareness. That awareness is not limited by any of those thoughts. It did not come with those thoughts. It does not go away with those thoughts. It is not it stuck to. Them, yeah. It does not control them either. Yeah, it does not control them either. It's the ego which tries to control them and fails. So you observe the ego. You observe the thoughts and perceptions. Uh, you observe the attempts at controlling and failure to control them, mm -hmm. sometimes success of controlling them. All of them observe in the sense that in your light it's all revealed. These things do not limit you, the light. You are not cut up, limited by them. You don't begin with them, you don't end with them. The joy of the ability to control something, the joy of uh, progress in spiritual life, that is also revealed by you. The frustration of not being able to control anything the curiosity of whether I can control or not, that is also revealed by you. You are not revealed by them. They are revealed by you. Right? They are not only revealed by you, they are revealed in you the light, in you the consciousness. You have no proof of them existing outside. And at least thoughts do not exist outside awareness. So they do not exist outside you. Other than you, they do not exist. Suppose you the light, you are not there. See, if, if a particular thought was not there, would you still be there? Yes, you would be there witness of all other thoughts. If a particular organ did not function, I can't see anymore. Am I still there? Yes. I am the awareness which sees that, which is aware of not being able to see. Is it aware of still hearing, still thinking, still speaking? But that awareness, if that is not there, what would remain in this field of experience? You the awareness, if you are not there, if you, you suppose, if, if it were possible, it's not possible, suppose somehow there is an off switch and a switch of this awareness which you are calling yourself, this witness, blank. Would the ego still be there? Would thoughts still be there? Would awareness go on? Would, what would go on? What would be like? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Blank. It would just be erased. You know, even the mind will say, no, 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 others would go on. But others, are that's, that's just a thought in the mind. And that mind itself would be erased. It would just blank. It would disappear into darkness. See, the whole panorama is not only revealed to you, the witness, who are not limited by anything in that panorama. It's revealed in you, the witness, and it has no existence apart from you, the witness. Yes. This unlimited nature of the witness which you are, we have already admitted it the unlimited nature of the witness is Brahman that this unlimited witness which you are not subject to change not subject to birth and death 
not subject to coming and going not of this kind or that kind this unlimited nature of awareness which you are that is brahman that is sat that is chit the moment you realize that it is unlimited it's also ananda that is satchidananda and say like uh, probably on the intellectual level it's very clear to me yeah. and also in the experiential kind of way it's also very clear although i still wish all of the desire going through me pulling right. me you know all kinds of ways messing me up and all of that right there once one one has realized one has understood this it's intellectual level i realize it and in a certain sense you are saying experientially is also it's there it's a matter of noticing it it's a matter of noticing it and it's a matter of staying with that noticing that staying with that noticing is called nididhyasana vedantic meditation and from that perspective whenever you have a problem desires are coming and messing me up you watch whose desire what is that desire what does it what kind of hold does it have upon me it has some hold when i am the ego but does it have any yes. hold upon me the yes, witness I see that the, yeah actually who is complaining is my ego right? yes and once you do that would you still have some control over it eventually yes eventually yes not straight away because this realization which is also in the mind the, the clarity is coming in the mind the witness consciousness needs no clarity it's always there so i will begin to put it this way um you have a curtain and there's a hole in the curtain which which shows you the reality behind the curtain it's just the hole which is getting bigger and bigger it's not the reality getting bigger and bigger the reality behind behind the curtain is you you are always perfect from your perspective it's all right uh, it's just the hole in it's the hole in the clouds which covers the perfect blue sky that hole is getting bigger as the clouds are dissipating that will take time Okay, this is a very good question. Um, who else is asking a question? Can you have it? You have to unmute yourself. Okay, Maharaj, you <clears throat> answered the first part of my question. What I wrote in the chat about where does it leave us, the spiritual seekers? You already answered that. Now. <clears throat> the question when somebody does get enlightened you said that the all the karmas leave but what about prarabdha all right Because they still live to the extent of their prarabdha right right so there is this adjustment to be made it's a kind of bookkeeping adjustment all karmas are destroyed uh, we just said dagdha sarva karmana in uh, the gita just said by the fire of knowledge all karmas are burnt but the, f- the problem now is then we see the enlightened person is still there the body is there and certain things are going on you know good and bad keep happening to that person so something is generating all that remember these people were strong believers in the uh, in karma cause and effect uh, actions and consequences we clearly see a chain of consequences coming i understand it because i'm a limited being under the sway of my karma but why is that enlightened being still there if all the karma has gone there should be no more consequences the body should drop off the moment of enlightenment but that's not a very good consequence because out of enlightenment if the body drops off after enlightenment enlightenment should be a one way street to you know the like suicide no enlightenment and suicide are not the same thing so after enlightenment clearly these people are still there why are they still hanging around it's good for us that they are hanging around because these are our teachers these are the masters from whom we learn they are they have seen and they teach us but what about karma the karma accountants are very finicky uh, where is this coming from so the adjustment that's made is there is a kind of karma which continues um, by the way this is not not true but i'm going to tell you what the the accepted theory is and then tell you why it's not true the idea is like this there's an archer it's a very ancient kind of uh, paradigm there's an archer who is shooting arrows so um the archer has released an arrow has put another arrow on the bow to uh, shoot and there are arrows in the quiver uh, which is uh, uh, there suddenly he decides not to shoot anymore so he throws away the arrow which he had in his hand and all the arrows in the quiver he throws them away so he will not shoot any more arrows but he has no control over the arrow which is in flight already released that will go and hit its target 
that's one example of prarabdha karma prarabdha karma means which has completely begun is totally in motion another example is the wheel the potter's wheel so there is a potter who is working on the wheel and has finished work and gets up and leaves but the wheel doesn't fall down doesn't stop immediately if he's given it a good shove it will go around a couple of uh, circles and then fall down that's like the prarabdha karma swami vivekananda in his uh, beautiful poem the song of the sanyasi the last verse is after enlightenment o thou monk after enlightenment what do you do um so no more has maya any power over you and go thou from place to place and help them out of maya's veil that's your only duty left now or only work left for you to help people be to go beyond maya you have gone beyond help others to go beyond um this body heed not how it lives or dies and then he says um let karma float it down uh, if that's the uh, original i i last verse um so let karma float it down means this prarabdha karma it will go on for a while the fan in the room if i switch it off it won't stop immediately it'll go around half a circle so these are all examples uh, like uh, analogies to prove that something goes on and that's what explains the persistence a, temp- a short persistence of the enlightened person and after the death of the body of the enlightened person the subtle body of the enlightened person uh, goes back to nature physical body goes back to nature like everybody else when we die uh, the physical body goes back to nature the five elements in the body go back to the five elements in nature and for us the subtle body the, that which limits the atman it continues from lifetime to lifetime propelled by karma but for the enlightened person who knows that i am the infinite the subtle body is no longer a cage uh, so it goes back to uh, to nature also subtle body and physical body both are made of nature all right so this is the let's say the theology behind it the book keeping to keep karma books straight now shankara acharya in aparoksha anubhuti he denies it flat out he says there really is some, something there is something deeper than this upon enlightenment what does one really realize that i was going through lifetimes propelled by this load of karma at my back and now i am set free thank god only this lifetime and after this eternal peace is that what what the enlightened person realizes he says no not at all the enlightened person realizes there were no lifetimes there was never a time i was i was in bondage if i'm not in bondage there is no question of past karma also all of that is a fiction from our relative perspective to set our books straight if you ask an enlightened person so i gather your enlightened uh, so mr enlightened person mr buddha or jivan mukta uh, so you have no future births but i know you are being propelled along by your prarabdha karma you will just laugh <laughs> none of it has any meaning for that person but we need to make sense of it so that's what we do that that's why that swami bhuteshanj his answer was so perceptive when he was asked so how does the enlightened being see the whole thing and his answer was who sees thank you yeah right by the way the prarabdha karma theory that's the standard advaitic explanation that's what you will find in just about every book what i said is a deeper um, explanation but it works both are correct one works from our perspective and one it's good for the textbooks uh, it makes the whole thing rational and logical but the reality is what i i said just now uh, what shankar acharya points out in aparoksha anubhuti yeah um all right then we have gone beyond time see there he takes up the question shankar acharya that this enlightenment applies uh, enlightenment and the question of action after an enlightenment applies equally to monks who withdraw from worldly activities and to householders who are still in worldly activities both can be enlightened the difference is this for the unenlightened both activity and passivity are problems we you one monk put it gave another nasty story to ex- uh, example to ex- explain this imagine there's a dog and the dog has fleas so when it goes and sits in the sun the fleas bite it and tormented by the flea, fleas the dog flees 
to to a sh to shade and to hide there the fleas become dormant in the shade but now the dog has parasites in its brain and in the darkness the parasites start biting in the, inside the brain and the dog tormented by the you know the pain in the brain rushes out into the sunlight where the parasites shut down but the fleas become active again he says that is the condition of uh, this is our condition engagement in the world it is problematic the fleas are it could be troublesome people it could be uh, you know problems like physical health mental problems uh, financial problems uh, covid problems what not those are the fleas from the world withdraw from it run away into a cave sit there and meditate you will have the parasites in the brain which will start <laughs> biting from inside frustration unhappiness loneliness um, meaninglessness what am i doing and people are out there doing great things they are not but that's what the mind will tell you when you're sitting in the cave and then you're pushed out into the world again same problem whereas for the un for the enlightened person krishna is saying neither activity nor passivity is a problem that person um, can be in intense activity like krishna himself or can withdraw from activity like ramana maharshi or uh, totapuri wander around not connected with anything like a traditional wandering monk of whom there are still some in, in india who are uh, enlightened it could be like that and neither is a problem for the enlightened person so the difference is this is crucial difference is not in involvement and lack of involvement the difference is not in activity or passivity karma or no karma that's not the difference the difference is knowledge and ignorance being enlightened not being enlightened that's the difference that's the crucial difference uh, from our perspective it seems is a huge difference between a person sitting in the mountain cave and a person actively engaged in in society and in family life but from uh, krishna's perspective the real difference is between enlightenment and not and, and being in ignorance that's the difference um so swami ranganathan ji's beautiful summation of spiritual life he says uh, when i open when i close my eyes i find peace within when i open my eyes my attitude is what can i do for you and that is the sum and substance of spirituality where does that come from from enlightenment if that's not there open my eyes what can i get from you from you the world close my eyes no peace within lack of peace restlessness unhappiness anxiety within that is because of ignorance okay that's a good point to end on om shanti 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 hari om tat sat shri ram krishna arpanamastu